Hi everybody, welcome. My name is James Van Leeuwen and uh, I'll be moderating this session. Um, I'm a native Albertan. I was born in Calgary, raised south of Cal Calgary in the foothills and uh, I'm very grateful to be an Albertan. I choose to live here. Um, this is a land of freedom and opportunity and I don't take it for granted. Um, I'd just like to share a little bit about my background with you before I introduce our three speakers uh, th this afternoon. Um, first, I got, a, I got a pretty strong affection for, uh, for Banff. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful place to be, period, just to hang out here. But I've had a lot of really great experiences here, and uh, I'll get to one of those in a moment here. I, I've, I've had opportunity galore because I've lived in Alberta. And uh, I studied astrophysics at the University of Calgary for 10 years. I was interested in becoming an academic. Um, after 10 years, I wasn't quite so interested in being an academic anymore. But uh, I got the opportunity to spend 10 years studying the cosmos. And uh, that was an amazing experience. And uh, I got to do it right here in Alberta at the University of Calgary. I then had the opportunity to work in the energy industry uh, for three years, I paid off my student loans and basically built a bit of a nest egg uh, so that I could start doing the things that I really wanted to do. Um, I've, I've long had a passion for uh, sustainability and uh, well, it's protecting and, and creating natural and social wealth in, in addition to personal wealth. So I wasn't, uh, I was concerned uh, a decade plus ago about the direction of the Alberta economy and I decided that I'd get involved in whatever efforts I, I I could find uh, to make some progress in that direction and, and help where I could. And first thing I got involved with was a nonprofit organization called Sustainable Alberta. Uh, we formed the organization to host an event called the Canadian Commuter Challenge, which is still going on today. Uh, the organization still survives. I haven't been involved for quite some time, but we got that event off the ground. And we had a very heavy emphasis on ICT at the time, the role that teleworking could play in uh, reducing single occupancy vehicle uh, commuting, um, basically moving the workplace out into, uh, into people's homes. And at the time, it seemed like a really great idea, but there wasn't an awful lot of traction about it. And certainly not in Alberta, it didn't, it didn't catch on much. But uh, anyways, the event continues, and I think it's coming back around now to this whole opportunity of, uh, of teleworking. Um, we partnered with a company that started up in Calgary at that time, they're called Teletrips. And they had this great idea of, let's track the difference uh, that it makes if people leave their cars at home in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So they recorded the make, model, and year of, of people's vehicles. And if they were using some alternative mode to get to them from work, whether it was teleworking or something else, they could record uh, that commuting choice and the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions will be calculated based on their vehicle. Uh, so that's still going on as well. That company still exists. It moved down to the United States for a while because they couldn't find capital here in Canada. Now, how many people know that story? So it's back here though. They've got four offices now, one in the States, three up here, including one in Calgary. Um, after that, I had an opportunity to work with an organization called Sustainable Futures by Design, which put on a conference right here at the Banff Center back in 2002. And it was around that concept of sustainable futures by design. And at that time, especially in the wake of uh, September 2011, there was a lot of interest in taking an active role in shaping economies so that we don't create the kinds of risks, social risks, that we experienced very directly uh, through September 2011. So at the time, the people who gathered for that event, there were about 100 of them, they were opinion leaders and also business leaders from around the province, various sectors. Uh, there's some in the nonprofit sector, some from the community sector. And it was actually a pretty emotional experience. Um, that had the unfortunate effect of actually driving some of the people away. <laughs> but a lot of people were very happy to have the opportunity to get their ideas out there. There wasn't a clear direction at that point. And the, the group dissolved uh, for lack of that. Didn't have a clear narrative and the story wasn't gelled, in other words, in a way that would draw more people into it. So I think that's changed today, and I'll be coming back to that one shortly here. Um, I moved back to rural Alberta uh, from Calgary, and after spending 
20 years there, uh, university and then working. I, I moved in 2002 with the arrival of the internet in Pincher Creek, Alberta, which is where I chose to live. Uh, I could work via the internet. Um, uh, it was a beautiful place to live. Um, I had all the recreational amenities that I was interested in and just lifestyle in general. And uh, so I wanted to stay in Alberta at the very least, again, land of opportunity. Uh, I started a consulting firm around that time as Ventus Development Services, I'm still doing that. And my focus was on sustainable economic development and in particular the role of ICT in uh, sustainable economic development. Um, I still have a very strong interest in that field and that's why I'm here today. I'm particularly interested in leveraging the Alberta Supernet, which is this fantastic investment, very thoughtful, foresight-driven uh, investment on the part of the Alberta government that we have yet to even come close to fully utilizing. And uh, so the rural uh, opportunities relating to ICT and, and the digital economy, bringing that economy out to rural Alberta, that's where most of my energy goes today. Um, I started up the firm in 2002. Um, my wife joined in 2004, Salisa Horvath. She is a consultant in corporate sustainable or corporate social responsibility and sustainable development, mostly for the resource industries. And her practice is now the one that really keeps us afloat. Uh, the whole strategic economic development thing hasn't been, there hasn't been a lot of demand for it in Alberta. So I've moved more into entrepreneurial pursuits. Um, now have a, a small, a uh, small firm based in Calgary that uh, is focused on advanced visualization solutions. You know, we've worked mostly in uh, academia with that. Um, I want to push off into industry though because that's the, the rapidly growing area of opportunity. So um, over the last few years uh, I've done a whole bunch of different things. I worked for some certified organic beef producers down in, uh, in Pincher Creek. And uh, I produced a report last year for the Alberta Economic Development Authority. It was called Accelerating Broadband Enablement in Rural Alberta. Um, basic recommendation was, there was that we need to start treating broadband as a utility and financing it. And uh, the leadership also needs to come from the same place as it did, say, for rural electrification projects way back when. Uh, it's the community that's really involved, needs to be involved uh, centrally. Great stories from Chris Moore at the City of Edmonton there, um, for those of you who heard them. And talk about leadership in the municipal context, uh, the community context, those are the best stories I've heard yet. So uh, I now uh, am working with one of the speakers today, Chris Perry. Um, Chris is a potato farmer, I'll let him in in introduce himself in greater depth later. Um, but Chris is building an anaerobic digester. It's a source of renewable power out there in rural Alberta. Happens to be 200 meters away from the Alberta Supernet and another optical fiber backbone. The idea is let's deploy a modular data center at that location, draw the power off the digester to power the data center. And instead of shipping data, or sorry, shipping electrical power into large urban centers, let's ship the data out to where the power is being generated. In the process, we'd re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we reduce the cost of computing, which is potentially the, 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 the strategic advantage that we'll have in Alberta when it comes to realizing the big opportunity around cloud computing. And uh, yeah, we're gonna create jobs in the process. And boy, do we need jobs in rural Alberta. Good jobs, not crappy work at Tim Hortons kind of jobs. We need real jobs that produce a lot more wealth and that's a sustainability issue for rural communities and a very urgent one. So, just uh, want to get to the, the critical thing here, the, the message, the big takeaway, um, which again we'll come back to later, but the critical challenge of our time is to design and develop economies in which we excel at producing and protecting natural and social wealth in addition to personal wealth so that future generations have at least, at least as much freedom and opportunity as we have enjoyed ourselves. That's a critical challenge, and I think we're up for it. I just wanna share a quote from a report that was produced by the Premier's Council on Economic Strategy. It was included in the report, sorry, it originated uh, with Stephen Joel 
principal at Canassi Strategy, is a young Albertan currently working in the UK. And uh, he says, throughout my lifetime, it seems Alberta has been an economy of circumstance. Do we now need to become an economy of intent? And I would say emphatically, yes, we do. We absolutely do. And we have a huge stake in that in Alberta. We may have one of the least sustainable economies on the face of the planet. It's hugely based on non-renewable non -renewable resources. So I won't dwell on that. Um, the, the critical need in realizing that vision is leadership. And Alberta is ideally positioned to lead in this effort. We have an environment, a uh, cold climate. This could be for the cloud computing opportunity. Uh, we have infrastructure, we supernet, uh, an abundance of academic post-secondary institutions. We have very capable people in this province, and that includes yourselves. And we have a lot of investment capital. And how do we create a value proposition for investors that brings that wealth into this challenge? So it's been a decade since that event um, that I was helping to put on here at, in, in, at the BAM Center, the Sustainable Futures by Design Conference. And like I said, there wasn't a clear narrative at that point. We didn't have a good enough story to tell. And now I think we do. Many more Albertans are already hungering to take this province in a new direction and to craft a new narrative about what we are all about. And we see this reflected in the emergence of new and progressive political leadership. Uh, congratulations to Alison Redford. And uh, I'll just quickly point out that, that she has spoken quite favorably, quite positively already about um, this entire context of uh, progressive economic development. And her deputy premier, Doug Horner, he gets this stuff. He gets the role of ICT in realizing this vision as well. So I'm hugely optimistic. I'm very pleased to see that change in leadership and I think we have a lot to hope for. So at this point in history though, Alberta's opportunities to lead Canada and perhaps even the world in the design and development of sustainable human economy. I truly believe that. I look at the people in this room and I think, why would we not be able to do this? So many of you in the audience and following over the internet today are already leaders in this effort and it is quite likely that the rest of you are well positioned to lead as well. So with that, I'd now like to introduce three people whom I've had the great pleasure of getting to know over the last year and a half. And all three are leaders in this effort to design and develop the Alberta economy. And they're going to share some of their stories with us over the next hour. First up will be Chris Perry. He's a spud farmer from southern Alberta and a progressive leader with a vision to integrate environmental stewardship and innovative technology into agriculture and the rural Alberta landscape. After Chris, we've got Nathan Armstrong, president of Motive Industries, 16 years of transportation design engineering experience in both aerospace and automotive sectors. And then we're going to wrap it up with Robin Windsor, who should no, need no introduction by this point, president of Cybera, and Robin is working to spur and support innovation for the economic benefit of Alberta, of Alberta through the use of cyber infrastructure. So with that, Chris. Take it away. Thank you, James. And I'm, as a potato farmer, I'm th thrilled to be here and a part of an IT conference. Probably the last thing you'd expect to hear. All right. So, I'm Chris Perry, and it, uh, it's true, I am a potato farmer. This is me sporting some new technology. I have neoprene comfortable rubber boots, a kyber, uh, carbon fiber reinforced potato fork, and some, some bags that I, I'm going to put the potatoes in. This is my family growing, nurturing, and loving potatoes. This is the neighbors and the family all pitching in to dig potatoes and put them in sacks. It takes a long time process of potatoes. And this is my dad and brother celebrating at the end of harvest last year. Toyota kick. No, truly we do grow potatoes. We have a 3,500 irrigated acre farm in southern Alberta. We grow 1,300 acres of potatoes and peas and sunflowers uh, for the likes of McCain's, Lucerne, Frito-Lay, 
we store the potatoes for up to 10, 10 months in the year, over 20,000 ton of potatoes. It's a big pile of potatoes. We store them in our monolithic dome storage facility in the metropolis of Chin, Alberta. So, Tim Wu talked about a little bit of the history of some of the technology, and I thought I could digress and go into a little bit of history of farming. And uh, Tim went back to 1930. I'm going to go back to 18 or 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago, and pose a question: What does ICT, cloud computing, and farming revolution in that time have in common? They're both cutting new technology for their time. The farming revolution began in the Fertile Crescent and a few other areas around the globe. This was the birth of civilization. It was the end of the Stone Age, right? It was the first, uh, first time in human history that we had luxury of time to do something else with. We were rich. This is when we started writing things down, the story of Gilgamesh, the, you know, things that led all the way up to cloud computing of today. Some of the important factors of farming revolution at that time is produce enough food to support the community, basic survival, support food from raiding neighbors, rise and fall of empires were based on productivity of land, fertility, and the, the cycle of Mother Nature, which I call MNS, is a little bit similar to PMS, but she's a little bit more forceful. This is a picture back in 05 on our farm. And so begins a quest for the productivity, or production sustainability and a required increase in yield per acre. And why? Um, we need to support the population that's growing today. So I'd just like to point out a quick few game-changing events of agriculture. Like I say, farming revolution. And it is an art. I call it the art of farming. Farmers are, in their way, artists. We try to do things a little bit better all the time. But there are some game-changers. Figure out, geez, you irrigate that wheat, it's going to grow a little bit faster. And the yield potential goes up dramatically. And we get back to a little bit more art. You know, you fix up the canals, you time the water applications a little bit better. Somebody says, hey, if we put a little bit of that goat and sheep poop on that crop of potatoes, we're going to grow a few more potatoes. And we have another spike in the yield potential. A little bit more art of farming. And all of a sudden, in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Justice von Liebig discovers the law of the minimum, the minimum and coming up with nitrogen fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer, potassium. And we have a guy in the early 1900s uh, by the name of Haber, won the Nobel Prize for figuring out how to take nit uh, atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into ammonia, which the plants can use. Bosch is the guy that commercialized that process, and they are credited today with feeding a third to a half of the population. For better or for worse, there's, there's some argument on that. And then we get back to a little bit more art, we get to the green revolution, plant breeding, selection of varieties. After World War II, the distribution channels are all in place for fertilizer and pesticides. And we have the GMO in the mid-90s, a little bit more art. And what do we have today? Hey, hey, we have some cyber infrastructure. This is the reality of today. Many people have seen this curve, but this is the population curve. And really, we go back to what supports that population curve is the food that's produced in the world. I don't think we're printing steaks and potatoes yet, Robin, so we're getting closer. And it is a closed biosphere. We're working with, uh, we can only produce so much food and support so much life. The prediction is out that only six countries within the dec decade will be exporting more, more food than they actually consume. So this talks about to the end of sustainability. The sustainability, we need to get back to natural cycles that support themselves and uh, not lead into something called a progress trap. Um, so some of the important factors of today, same thing, producing enough food to support the population, security of the food, you know, the rise and fall of the population based on the productivity and good old mother nature, all about the yield per acre. So how can cyber infrastructure help? Somebody's saying, thank goodness, he's talking our language for a second. So I, I say there's a, there's a number of ways that cyber infrastructure can help. Uh, best management practices, taking the technology of today and what we know today and implementing that right now. Uh, food safety, real-time public communication, there's not near as many people today that understand where their food comes from as there has been throughout the history of time. And we need to gap that communication. We need to bridge that communication gap, sorry. 
And then precision agriculture dialed up. So technology, use the technology to get more yield per acre. And certainly an empathy and a desire to feed the world. Okay. We can come together to create a new Alberta champion. So best management practice. Let's go through a few examples. I'd like to point out in the vision of, of Nathan Armstrong, you're going to hear in a bit, but just some phenomenal value add. Uh, that's uh, one of Nathan's biocomposite uh, molds for a new vehicle. This is us harvesting on September 30th here of this year. Um, these are flax bales, and uh, that can go to make this. And I'm sure Nathan will touch on that a little bit, but some value add with the technology there is phenomenal. Um, what are we doing? James mentioned a little earlier, we are doing a waste energy project. So the philosophy, and we're using built in Alberta technology, high mark renewables, and the Alberta Research Council at the time did a ton of work on that. So we're taking the best technology available today and trying to implement it into our system. So this is, a 30, this is our 3,500 acre farm. The Grow the Energy is our, our sort of new venture with the anaerobic digester. So we're taking our cold potatoes from the farm. We, we throw away a lot of potatoes, okay? Quality potatoes, so you'd say, why on earth are you throwing away? So they go back out to the field. We have biodegradable waste from municipalities, everything from leaf, leaf and grass clippings to um, kitchen scraps. Feedlot manure in the area. So we take this combination, we put it in an anaerobic digester process, a stomach, capture the methane value, okay? Run a cogen system, take the, the digestate back out from the, the system, and return the nutrient value to the farm. Um, we're, we're basically gonna be producing about 540 exportable kilowatts, which, which is about, uh, we, we only use about 100 to 150 on our farming operation. Numerous benefits, digestates like compost, reduces the synthetic fertilizer and pesticide use that will go on the farm, destruction of pathogens, uh, reusing of the water, uh, biodegradable uh, fill from municipalities. This contributes to about 45 to 50 percent of what goes into a landfill today is, uh, is biodegradable. We can capture that energy to run data centers, some of our cloud computing, and reduce the ridiculous uh, cost behind landfills to boot. Um, reduce the spreading of raw manure, that's a serious environmental issue as well. Some of the, well, the, the odor alone, but the, the runoff potential in phosphorus and LJ uh, problems in the, in the lakes and rivers of today. So future outlooks, some synergistic projects that we're certainly looking with on the farm is, is the one that's of already been mentioned, is the data center, bringing the, thing, bringing the data and the computing to the energy source. And what we're looking at is a real replicable kind of, replicable kind of system. So we're, we're an average size farm in southern Alberta. There's, there's probably 50 to 80 other opportunities within the demographic of Alberta with agriculture, waste, and communities that could build similar systems at a, at a smaller scale. So you take all these and you talk about a distributed uh, wealth model. So you're dealing with waste challenges, you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which data centers on the rise, unfortunately, are doing the opposite to but combine them and create a distributed wealth and a, a secure system. So I think there's an incredible potential there. This is just a nice little conceptual drawing of what we're looking at. We're, we'll be building this facility next year, uh, commissioning it within the year 2012. We're also looking at uh, an LJ farm, putting up a Alberta LJ Center of Excellence, I hope within, uh, within a year or so at that, the Lethbridge College and the potential of that is another one. This is just a, another little future of farming uh, schematic uh, f outfit from Kentucky. Are you talking about LJ, a biorefinery, uh, a biogas plant, uh, fermentation for healthy feed for the animals? And again, just looking at a closed loop, really utilizing all the waste, turning it into energy, producing excess, feeding. It's, it's a completely healthy, self healthy cycle, a self-sustaining cycle, which is what we need to be getting back to. So the second aspect that cyber infrastructure can help certainly is with food safety, food production, and communication. So we do a tremendous amount of reg record keeping right now, regulation, traceability, stewardship. Our processors and, and uh, the consumer is asking for more all the time. And we have that information. Uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge to get that real-time information. And, and I hope uh, with the people in the room and, and working together, we can get systems that seamlessly will integrate. So if we go into our field and we apply a fertilizer, or albeit a pesticide, 
We input that into their tractor's computer, and real time it gets downloaded into our system. And by the time you buy that potato or steak in the in the grocery store, it's all all the information is there. There's a there's a ton of uh, replicated data entry going on right now. So that's an easy one, uh, and certainly collaboration is necessary. I mean, we we are farmers. We're not techie guys, and and we need some help that that is available. And again, it's been mentioned before, but collaboration in these sectors. Uh, I am an advocate of agriculture, and I'm certainly an advocate of getting the technology into agriculture that's available. Um, so precision agriculture is, a, in my opinion, an exciting one. This is the real return yield, yield per acre. So what the, what the technology can do. So this is why it's significant. This is a, this is a picture of our, our field this spring. It's lovely, really. You can see the lake of Chin here, um, the lake of northern Chin, and this and that. But there's also soil variability all the way through this field. And what I'm getting at is we, c we need to treat those areas differently. We have variable rate technology today, so you can spread fertilizer, uh, different rates throughout the field. We have infrared and other spectral imagery um, tools that can be utilized. And this is an exciting one, is uh, variable rate irrigation. Um, so understanding a pivot, just. Uh, there was a lot of stuff I did not understand in this techie talk earlier, so uh, if, if, if people don't understand a, um, a little bit of mine, that's okay, but I'll, I'll try to <laughs> do some justice here. So just a, a center pivot irrigation. When you're flying over fields that look like this, it's kind of like, why on earth are those guys farming around? Well, it's our automated sprinkler system. So there's basically, it's called a pivot because it's a pivot and it goes around and around. So there's a pivot point here, and this system will go around. And so this variable rate irrigation system is now we can take a computer panel at the, the, the center. It's all tied into GIS. We put in different zones, so the pivot knows exactly where it's at in the, in the field, tied in with the GPS. And the GIS systems, you can build recipes to irrigate this three acres of the field, half an inch, this three acres, three quarter of an inch. Phenomenal potential for reducing inputs, um, environmental pressures, conservation of water. Um, a progressive farmer, and I would even say an unprogressive farmer, says Yahoo. I mean, this is a big one for irrigation. You can also fertigate within the field um, in season. So we put on a lot of fertilizer through that pivot system in the field in season. And if you're able to target different areas, there's, a, there's just a vast potential. So I'd like to just give a, little, a couple real time. This is a potato crop we grew down at the beautiful river bottom this year. Nice flat field. But there's also, it's not just topography. So you, if you look within this, I hope you guys can see it okay, but this is a nice flat field this spring. So there's different textures of soil, and this is a, this is a picture of the field mid-season. So you can just see the darker green areas and the lighter green areas. This is a yield map just before we dug it, uh, taken with satellite imagery. Anything pinkish purple is over 20 ton to the acre. The, light, uh, the blue and less is, is 18 ton to the acre and less. Understand the similar inputs are going in on that whole field. So what are the potentials if you can bring that all up to 20 ton per acre? Um, this is a sad story. Potato field, I, I can complain like a farmer, no problem if you want to talk to me later, it's, it's easy. This is last spring. We planted 128 acres in this field, okay? We harvested 80 acres. And we put in about a little over $2,000 an acre operational input. So that goes into every acre on that field right now, regardless of whether we harvest that or not. So are there some opportunities? Anybody seeing an opportunity? I hope so. 2010, the whole farm, we planted 1,300 acres of potato, potatoes. We only harvested 82% of that due to excess moisture. In 2011, we planted 1,280. We only harvested 87% of that this year. And it's been a, actually a really nice year, except for this spring. And then uh, we harvested, and we've just finished digging about 22,000 ton of potatoes. And uh, it rained two and a half inches on us yesterday. And that's a big deal. So the, we'll see what happens to the last 3,000 ton in the field that may stay there. So this is what a, a, a nice field can look like. So this is the potential. Here's some software that's attempting to do what I'm talking about, and I think we can do a lot better. Uh, this is a program out of Holland. Um, Ianctus has actually just acquired some, or Blackbridge Holdings has acquired some satellites that, that we are, they, these guys are using that imagery, so that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, 
what we're doing is using a satellite. It goes over the fields. Once a week, we get a picture. And from that picture, we can monitor a number of different things. We take a look at growth, moisture. We can, uh, this is the biomass. So we take a weekly, how the field's doing biomass. This is the percentage of nitrogen in the upper leaf canopy. So when you talk about fertilizer recipes in season, that's, that's fantastic potential. Um, here's a, just another field of ours with a nice little river running through the middle of it. The, the thing with variable rate irrigation is right now when we run that pivot through this field, we have to irrigate this area, same as this area. That we don't have the ability to do that different. We can speed it up to a point. But when you can, when you can start dialing that in, and that's a, that's a cumulative effect. Because if you have a swamp right now from that two and a half inches, this spring coming up, it's going to be a swamp as well. So if you're, if you're managing that different from year to year, the potential to get better and better is, is obviously there. Um, again, just back to, you know, 20, 20 ton to the acre, 80% of this field has the ability to do better, or, you know, it, maybe that's the maximum potential and law of minimums that this soil can produce in this given year. But then we should cut the inputs and the rest of it. There's no use feeding it the same amount of inputs. So there's a lot of dollars to go in a lot of different ways. That's how much time left? Oh, I love that technology. For me, or for everybody? Okay. <laughs> Better start talking real fast. Um, thank you. So what can we do tomorrow with the applications? And I say um, we have a lot to do. Within, Al within Alberta, listening to the, con the, the conference this week, uh, you know, I, I say we can up the ante on that software. That unmanned aircraft concept, the UAV, uh, send up a little, a little drone daily that goes around, takes a little picture of the field. We have the sensor people that can say, you need a little bit more water on this area than that area. Build real-time recipes um, and reduce the amount of inputs and the environmental footprint on everything we're doing is fantastic. Uh, integrated data hub, um, we have, we're trying to create a sort of a flagship idea that can be replicated throughout Alberta, throughout, throughout Canada. It's, it's, it's the way we need to go. The smart energy grid has been mentioned, ship, ship data, not power. Uh, I love it, the distributed idea. I'm, I'm all on board. I think the distributed wealth and technology out to the rural areas is fantastic. And linking the public with food and uh, uh, real time and real seamless. So be a sustainable smart system and, and close biosphere aware. Um, so I say, this is our circle that we want to grow the energy and let's, let's take it another step. Let's take in the data management hub. Let's put it to work with a, an information communication technology link. Um, we can feed information back to the farm, selfishly back to the farm, precision agriculture, grow more yield per acre. Um, working with some of the projects Cyber is doing. I mean, why, if we have a distributed uh, data center run off complete renewable energy within the, the demographic of Alberta and Canada, you know, why couldn't we be hosting that on some of our own data hubs within this, this underutilized network as has been mentioned? Water environmental hub, uh, lots of potential there. Green Star Network, follow the wind, sun, and biogas. Just thought I'd put that in there. We happen to be building this waste energy facility about 200 uh, meters away from two fiber optic strings. Again, this is a serious return on investment for Alberta all the way through. It is, uh, it's, a real, it's a real deal. So I thought I would throw Robin up here, handsome man that he is. I, I read a tweet a little earlier that the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. That's, uh, that's absolutely right. I agree 100% with that. But I'd like to add it also ended because we discovered farming at that time. Um, thank you. So the opportunity, James has mentioned the opportunity. I think collaboration with all the right people in the room. Alberta can advantage. Let, let's, I think we have the opportunity to all be a part of this. Um, technology, cyber, uh, infrastructure presence in the room, Robin, Siberia, Geosense, everybody here. The value add and true example of technology, wow, that you're about to hear from Nathan. I, it's just incredible some of the stuff he's working on. Um, rural Development and Distributed Wealth Advocate, James Van Leeuwen, I, I'm on the same page. I'm the farmer, but there's lots of us out there, okay? We have a need that recognizes technology can help us do better and uh, achieve 
you know, what the potential is. We, we, we need to feed this growing population, guys. I read some tweets a little earlier on, on d big data is the new oil. Well, I'm, an I'm gonna put on my ag hat and say agriculture is the next big oil too. Uh, if, we, if we start getting hungry, that's the first thing that comes to mind is where's our food coming from? So let's be a part of it. Fantastic R&D presence in Alberta. I mean, we have Alberta Innovates, f phenomenal stuff. Uh, refreshed and inspired, like James mentioned, with the provincial leadership in place now. I think they're all on board. We have universities and colleges that are all ready to, to go. And I, I think we've started the integration and the collaboration. I think we need to do it a bit more. So together, let's make it happen. And why make it happen? It's relatively obvious. This is our real, real return on investment, long-term investment, Canada, Alberta. Thank you very much. 24 seconds. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here today. I would like to... Uh, Take a bit of time, um, and uh, 15 minutes to be exact, and run you through a, um, an industrial perspective on cloud computing. And um, I'd like to start a bit of rundown on my company, not as a sales pitch, but just so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so we're a vehicle design company. Um, been around for about seven years now. Involved in a lot of big projects with a lot of data. Um, any type of vehicle, whether it be car, or aircraft, or boat, or spacecraft, what we're doing now, generates a tremendous amount of data. And this is a challenge that we're seeing within our own infrastructures currently. Uh, we deal with a lot of um, very interesting projects, like electric vehicles, that type of stuff. Uh, we won some awards in the last couple of years, so good recognition in Alberta about the work we're doing. Uh, what we do essentially then, we clean sheet design, we get into graphic design, uh, we get into, this is where the data starts getting heavy, is actually on the class A surface, so at this point we're using some pretty deep math to generate the surface data. Photo renderings again, a uh, huge amount of computing power to do these renderings. A lot of engineering. Um, again, today we're actually hitting the limits of what we can do with our kind of micro supercomputers we have in the office on the analysis side. Um, it's becoming a real challenge for us. And we're seeing the data growth, uh, it's just skyrocketing at the minute. We're not sure how, uh, from a hardware side, we can keep up with this. Um, we do a lot of prototyping, 3D printing. Tooling and fixturing, so again, we do the, we do the uh, prototyping. Uh, a lot of testing and analysis. Again, like I said, the analysis side really is very, very data heavy. And uh, again, it's a challenge for us. Manufacturing support, and then we help with some marketing, some launch support of the product uh, when it starts. So um, what I'd like to talk about kind of with the main, the main kind of uh, point I'd like to make here, um, you know, I've been in Canada for five years now, and really seeing opportunity up here with the uh, talent and uh, the infrastructure that we have to maybe grow um, the wealth generation in a very incredible way. Um, what we do best up here, I found, is, is, is think and imagine and take an idea into something that actually has a tremendous amount of wealth potential. Uh, this is just a quote from uh, Bank of Canada talking about the opportunity for Canada has um, in this space. But what I'd really like to talk about is the way that design is heading today. And there's been uh, you know, a lot of good conversations happening here, but I haven't heard anybody yet talk about how we would use cloud networks to do industrial design. And the reason I think this is important is because the wealth generation potential here is, is much larger than I think anybody realizes. Um, on the open market today, a vehicle design that is ready for production is worth somewhere around $100 million. And that represents not a lot of time spent uh, by a very uh, intelligent group of people uh, working collaboratively. So. When we talk about rural economies, uh, we talk about ways to support towns you know, that otherwise would be shut down by the closure of the mill or the closure of the mine. Um, you know, we think that this is an, uh, an opportunity that we can maybe tap into. And it's kind of a, um, it's a personal thing for me because we're at the point with my company now where we don't want to hire more people. We don't want to bring more people to the office. We don't want to have more people driving an hour a day to come to the office to save for eight hours and drive home again. It makes no sense. Everybody in the business is more interested in telecommuting. Um, I do a lot of talks at universities, I talk to you know, engineering students, and I always say, who wants to work in a big office downtown Calgary? And I don't see a single hand go up. And I say, who wants to work at home in their pajamas? Everybody's hand goes up, right? I say, okay, well this is great, but the amount of data that we're talking about here is terabytes of data. 
how do we move this data? How can you work, how can you telecommute? If you're doing word processing, okay, you can work at home. If you're working on this stuff, there's no way you can work at home unless you've got cyber infrastructure, you've got cloud computing, you've got some really hardcore data centers that are accessible um, to these communities. And uh, to Chris's point, um, having a data center in Calgary, if everybody's working in southern Alberta, doesn't, again, make a whole lot of sense. So distributed data centers suddenly becomes a very good idea. And when we talk about wealth generation, this is the theme that we're going to use. This is a network that we're going to use to actually do the work with. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about cloud computing being a resource, but what are we going to do with it? What is actually the point of having this network? How do we generate wealth with it? Well, from an industrial design standpoint, I think we have a good opportunity here. Um, this is just an example of uh, one of the design tools that, that is standard in the industry. It's called CATIA. Uh, it's been around since the mid-70s. Um, every single aerospace, every single space program has been done on CATIA. About 85% of vehicle designs are on CATIA today. And um, it just went cloud-based about three years ago. Uh, we just got our first seat um, about four months ago, a V6 now it's called, and it's all cloud-based. And there's been some challenges in moving this much data. Uh, we're looking at having to put uh, essentially signal amplifiers throughout the network so we can actually move the data. Um, so we're kind of understanding some of the um, uh, challenges. But essentially how this works is that you have a product, whether it's a car, whether it's a spacecraft, no matter what it is, sits on a cloud server and is active real time all the time. Then anybody can dial into this network and they can pull out a piece of the project, they can do their work on it, and they can post it back into the main, uh, the main, the main system. And you can bill out for that time. It's, it's billable hours. Um, so this is actually happening right now. This is quite exciting for us because it means that, again, I can work from home in my pajamas like I used to back in the good old days. Um, but it means everybody can work this way. And when we start talking about how can we generate wealth using this cloud network, this to me seems like a, a really interesting opportunity. I want to talk about this real quick, and um, I want to get into a few things here to demonstrate that this is already happening. Um, this isn't anything pie in the sky stuff. This is actually happening today. Um, this is a little project that, that we helped kind of seed called the Super Designer Initiative. And um, we're four months into this program now in Alberta. Um, essentially, there's a handful of government agencies come together and um, like the idea of trying to get higher end design tools into the school system. Um, so we raised a good amount of money. Um, we put the program in place. We hired uh, five fresh graduates out of school. Uh, we got 20 seats of Katia and we picked three big projects to run. We picked an aircraft interior, uh, we picked a vehicle chassis design, and we picked an ambulance to design from scratch. And um, we kind of did it as a bit of a beta program to see if it would work. If it was successful, we are looking to bring this tool now into the school system potentially in a couple of years. Uh, the problem on the back end is, is demand um, from the market to actually use Alberta for this service. Chicken and egg problem, but you know, you're gonna start somewhere. And this is what this, um, this project was designed to do. So. We're working through the bugs. We're working, we have the server, it's in Toronto. Um, we're working in Alberta. And of course, if our challenge is moving the data to Toronto and saving these big, massive files, once you get up into the, like I say, you start working on this data and very quickly it gets very, very large. And uh, we're trying to save this all on one server in Toronto. So we're working through that. Uh, we've got Dassault Industries, who is uh, one of France's largest companies, who is actually the provider of the software, helping us with this challenge. And um, so far, so good. It's, it's actually turning out to be a way that we think, um, using the cloud network, we can actually generate quite a lot of wealth. Um, like I say, you know, this is, this is high dollar work. This is 120, 150 an hour you know, paid work. And right now, we've got four or five projects that we would love to put onto a network like this. It would be fantastic, because right now, we're looking to either outsource to India or to bring more people into our own office. Again, both of them have significant challenges. So this is kind of my... Uh, my challenge to the group here, can, how can we put this together? You know, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm not really an expert on cloud networks, um, but I would love to see a way to really leverage this new, this new power to do some of these projects and actually generate some wealth, especially in small towns and rural communities. Um, just as an example of what's happening down in southern Alberta, we have this excellent place, the Black Ridge Data Center. Um, this is perfect, it's on the it's on West Grid, it's on the, it's on the optic fiber network. And uh, I believe Cyber has already got some, some work going on there, and we're hoping to maybe uh, start thinking about how we can do this. How can we actually port our projects onto a data center outside of our own business? And that's tied into this larger network. Another example, Tech Connect down in Lethbridge. I'm on the board of advisors um, for this place. Uh, just opened about three or four months ago. And as we talk about you know, virtual companies, as we talked about dispersed networks, um, you do need a place to come together once in a while and throw ideas around. So again, places like this are really um, 
I think, providing the opportunity to um, be able to run a virtual network but still have a place to meet, you know, that's kind of local to everybody. And, um, you know, kind of provide a, just a hub, a uh, bit of a, bit of a, a route uh, for the network to live in. So that's pretty much the end of what I've got to say. Um, but just kind of make the point clear again, I think, that the, the potential for wealth generation using the cloud system here is, is extraordinary. And um, I would like to hear more about industrial design, engineering, you know, analysis, um, as could be used on the cloud, uh, because I think that's really where we're going to see some of the real significant wealth generation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Robin. Thank you very much. joke the other day about the fact that the great thing about standards was there's so many of them. But some of them just sort of seem to work. We at least managed to connect our computers up and have them talk to each other, even if they're kind of different kinds. Um, a, quick, uh, a quick warning note to some of you who were in the session yesterday. Much of this is going to be repetitive of one of the sessions yesterday, but uh, I know that we've got concurrent streams. And uh, James had asked me to try and tie together some of the, uh, the excellent work that uh, James, Chris, and Nathan are doing and talk again about the infrastructure. So I'm just going to run through that. Um, if you were in the yesterday's session, then now might be a good time to check your email. Um, so we know that uh, internet access is absolutely fundamentally important. We've been hearing about that in the abstract, but today we've heard from, from Chris about how that can really affect the agricultural sector, uh, from Nathan about how that's affecting uh, industrial design, the need to move around terabytes of data, and how it all ties together. So those are very concrete examples. We know that our ranking internationally is slipping from 19th now down to 22nd, um, and clearly these have to be fixed if, their econo if the uh, economy is to be driven from these things. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to cast your mind back to the, uh, the, uh, the early days um, of infrastructure. Uh, Tim this morning managed to get us back to uh, oh, sort of 1900 or so. I thought I was going to push a little back further until uh, Chris rolled out, uh, you know, uh, Neolithic agriculture. So I, I've, I've been thoroughly beaten on that one. But we know that as our country has developed, the infrastructure has to be built initially uh, very loosely. But then once we start putting that on a solid footing, um, this picture of the uh, the last spike being driven is absolutely key. It was the fundamental part in the history of Canada where we start to establish the way of being able to move our goods from where they are produced to where they are consumed. And without that, we really don't have an economy to speak of. It tends to be far too local. And whilst there's a local element to what Chris is describing, um, the fact is that all of it then has to be tied together into a fabric that interconnects. So Cybera is certainly part of that, and let me describe how some of that goes. When we think about the infrastructure uh, as it was built out in the early part of the 20th century, the highway systems, we built one highway from Calgary to Edmonton, from Montreal to Ottawa, whatever. Um, not four of them in parallel and trying to compete with who can drive their resources down one road or another. It makes sense to share infrastructure and to drive uh, competition based on services over that infrastructure rather than who has the facilities. Again, a theme that I think that we can come back to from what Tim was telling us this morning. Because of our population density, we have to be innovative about that. Things like uh, radio is a fantastic way to join together a country the size of Canada, where we have the second largest land mass in the world and a tiny population. And sometimes it's not going to make economic sense on particular points. Nobody else is going to want to fly to Taktiaktak or Akalawit unless they've got a flag on the tail. You don't do it because that particular route makes money. You do it because we're a country that needs to be tied together. So um, as, uh, as, as Chris picked, picked up, obviously, uh, we have the, uh, the advantage here in Alberta of oil. And why would we, uh, we worry about that? But uh, as I do like to say, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. Um, there are threats to those traditional uh, industries. We do have the, uh, the agricultural sector, and whilst it's true that we can't yet print um, with 3D printing and stem cell technology at stake, those, uh, those, te those trends are coming along, and so there are fundamental changes going on. The infrastructure, the fabric that binds it all together is key to making all this work. So 
Um, the question that I pose, and I think that really what uh, Chris and Nathan and James are trying to say is, are we going to pay attention to these warning signals? Are we going to see the changing signs, um, the need to diversify our economy, to engage these smaller towns, that large percentage, 25% of Alberta's population, that's in uh, what we would classify as rural areas or those uh, small centres that serve the, the rural areas? Or are we going to just ignore this and assume that we can indeed continue to, uh, to work on a, a rip and ship uh, model for our economy? As James pointed out, we want to have good quality jobs so that we can have a nice, uh, nice quality of life. Um, if the jobs are just a means to getting quality of life, what sort of jobs do we want? Do we want these sort of jobs? And most of us would say, no, we don't. And we frankly can't have them anyway. Those jobs have long since gone off to China, to India. Those manufacturing type jobs, the mass market jobs, are based on the cost of labor and they've long since left our jurisdiction. We're trying to develop the interesting jobs that Nathan was, uh, was describing, or the freedom to work within the farm and have that, that nice quality of life um, and not have to abandon those areas to go where the jobs are. So how do we tie it all together? And really, uh, what a lot of this comes back to is cost of computing, the cost of tying it all together. And that cost of computing has these elements to it. And cloud computing certainly addresses the hardware and so software side of things, but the networking side is extremely important, and I want to focus that on that just now rather than uh, on the, the cloud aspect as we were talking about yesterday. We know that data is exploding. My favorite example here is the square kilometer array that produces vast amounts of data, but as Robert pointed out uh, yesterday, that's not going to come on stream for a while, but we're seeing more and more from the sensor networks. How many of you are surprised to see the level of technology that Chris was describing where he's getting multispectral data from satellites figuring out exactly how things are growing right down to the square meter within his farm to get an analysis of how he has to maximize the yields. Those are very, very solid applications of the technology to today's um, economy. Cybera's network ties together with the supernet. Um, James was mentioning the supernet. Uh, this is a tremendous resource that's greatly underutilized. That ties together with the national network. And here is that supernet uh, point of presence in Pincher Creek, James's hometown. That's tying together to fixed area wireless. And from that area, we can see that there's tremendous, that same point, we can see there's tremendous wind generation potential. So we're seeing power generation, we're seeing the networks, we have all these things in place. Uh, I'm gonna skip through this in the interest of time and from the fact that uh, we covered some of this yesterday. Um, but just to give a measure of scale, 2.2 gigawatts is the targeted wind uh, power in the uh, southern Alberta region. Uh, compare that with the Old Man River Dam here, that's 35 megawatts, just for an idea of scale. All of that power does end up in the Pincher Creek area where we see this marker right outside the, uh, the aggregation point for the power. Um, this is the uh, fiber optic marker for the, uh, the Shaw line. Um, if we look at the same point uh, in that ditch, we'll see Shaw, Bell, TELUS, the Alberta Supernet, all running right past the biggest source of green power in the province, right past the, um, the, uh, the, the small town that desperately needs to participate in the modern digital economy. Tying all this together is the essential task that Cybera adds as the glue to the work that farmers like Chris are using to use the latest technology. Um, engineers like Nathan are using to bring together and make sure that the data can flow to the people that need it. The infrastructure is the essential build-out. And if we do this right, if we leverage the supernet, which is our absolute ace in the hole here, we can drive our cost of computing in Alberta down below the cost of computing in Beijing or in Bangalore, and that will help us to attract the businesses and put everything that we're doing here on a distributable footing so that we don't need to just cluster in the centers. And the quality of life within those small towns is something that's very special. It's something that you don't get elsewhere and that we can make viable by tying it together with that infrastructure. I'm going to wrap up rather than uh, continue on that one because I want to give time for James to, uh, to sort of uh, conclude the, uh, the, uh, the tie together on this one. Um, final thought though, uh, 
the meeting that, uh, that really sparked James, Nathan, and, and uh, Chris and I to get together and talk about this one was fascinating. As we started looking at the synergies between them, talking about using things like unmanned aerial vehicles to get more of that sensor data, really instrumenting everything and bring it together, it made me realize how cloud computing, our water and environment hub project, the GeoSense project, it all ties together to really produce an advantage here in Alberta. And if we do it right, we can have an impact. We just need to make sure that message gets through. Thank you. So that's just a taste of, of what's going on in Alberta now. And uh, thanks to Chris and Nathan and, and Robin for, uh, for sharing the stories. Um, the potential is huge. And uh, I, one of the reasons I love living in Pincher Creek is uh, because you can see the future from there. Um, <laughs> you look out the window, you see wind turbines, um, you know, mostly around the horizon now. Uh, a lot of people don't like that. I, th I think it's fantastic. I shouldn't say a lot. Um, there are uh, some people who, uh, who don't like the aesthetic impact on the land, but, you know, would you rather have an oil well or uh, would you rather maybe have the tar sands in your backyard? Those are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, the conversation revolves around in, uh, in the community. So anyways, uh, I, I see this potential, uh, you know, the uh, fiber optic going through there, we've got the renewable energy. Southern Alberta, just in general, I think is ripe with opportunity. And Chris, uh, you know, what you're doing there with, uh, with GrowTech, fantastic idea. We can leverage that uh, very effectively. Now, the three, uh, sorry, the four of us are going to be uh, involved in a, an event um, in Lethbridge on October 17th called Picture. And that's an acronym. It means putting ICT to use in rural economies. And what we hope to do, it's the same thing that we hope to do here today. We want to rally the leadership within the communities, within the industry, and within government around this opportunity. And although pictures focus principally on rural communities, it applies across the province. Our opportunity really is to lead in Alberta in this whole challenge of designing economies that are sustainable that protect wealth creation, uh, and that includes uh, you know, wealth as natural capital, social capital. Um, we're, we're sitting on top of a gold mine in that respect. So if that's something that's of interest to you, we'd love to talk with you. You're, you're, you'd be welcome to, uh, to join us in Lethbridge for the event on October 17th. Just send me an email. Uh, my email address is jvl at ventus.ca. And one last other initiative to bring to your attention is the iCanada initiative. Uh, this is a nationwide initiative now, which is endeavoring to do the same thing. It is trying to draw the leadership together that can start moving us in this direction. And it's basically building a new Canadian dream, um, an intelligent nation, as they call it. And uh, if you're interested to get involved with that, again, I'm, an, I'm involved, Robin's involved with that. We'd be happy to share what we know. Please. Uh, Get involved, um, leadership is the key, and uh, so let's take the initiative. And with that, um, I turn it over to uh, the floor, if there are questions from the floor. Do we get two, uh, time for two questions, Jana says. No, okay. Yeah, we'll break then. We're we're going to take a very short um, coffee break so that we can... Okay, after this question, we're going to take a short coffee break and move into Chris Kemp's keynote ahead of schedule just to accommodate some people who have to leave early to catch shuttles. Uh, Stuart Lomas with Alberta Council of Technologies. I'd love to talk to you about the event. Is there an, a, a website for it, a URL? Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to, to get everything up on the screen here, but... Uh, uh, well, for the event in Lethbridge, um, that one we've been sending out by personal invitation. We don't have a lot of space. That's the reason why. And we've been pretty selective about who we've been targeting. Uh, absolutely, we'd, we'd be very interested to have uh, representation. And sorry, is ABC Tech, did you say? Great. Okay. I, I know Terry Cooper is going to be there uh, as well. So it'd be great to have you down. You're Stu, right? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Great. Um, I'll, I'll talk with you after. The iCanada initiative, you can find that through the CATA Alliance website, Canadian Advanced Technology Alliance. They're the host organization for that one. And they're going to be having an event in Windsor, November 16th to 17th. It's the first meeting of their advisory board. 
Um, and basically, it's how do we do this? How do we realize this vision for Canada? Uh, craft a new narrative and start moving the country in, in that progressive direction where we're designing the economy, protecting the natural wealth, the social wealth, in the process of creating a lot of personal wealth as well. So any questions, come and meet us afterwards. Thanks a lot.